Chapter Two, Part One of *The Girl on the Boat* by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Part One: Gallant Rescue by Well-Dressed Young Man. One. The White Star liner Atlantic lay at her pier with steam up and gangway down, ready for her trip to Southampton. The hour of departure was near, and there was a good deal of mixed activity going on. Sailors fiddled about with ropes. Junior officers flitted to and fro. White-jacketed stewards wrestled with trunks. Probably the captain, though not visible, was also employed on some useful work of a nautical nature, and not wasting his time. Men, women, boxes, rugs, dogs, flowers, and baskets of fruits were flowing on board in a steady stream. The usual drove of citizens had come to see the travellers off. There were men on the passenger list who were being seen off by fathers, by mothers, by sisters, by cousins, and by aunts. In the steerage there was an elderly Jewish lady who was being seen off by exactly thirty-seven of her late neighbours in Rivington Street. And two men in the second cabin were being seen off by detectives, surely the crowning compliment a great nation can bestow. The cavernous customs sheds were congested with friends and relatives, and Sam Marlowe, heading for the gangplank, was only able to make progress by employing all the muscle and energy which nature had bestowed upon him, and which, during the greater part of his life, he had developed by athletic exercise. However, after some minutes of silent endeavour, now driving his shoulder into the midriff of some obstructing male, now courteously lifting some stout female off his feet, he had succeeded in struggling to within a few yards of his goal, when suddenly a sharp pain shot through his right arm, and he spun round with a cry. It seemed to Sam that he had been bitten, and this puzzled him, for New York crowds, though they may shove and jostle, rarely bite. He found himself face to face with an extraordinarily pretty girl. She was a red-haired girl, with the beautiful ivory skin which goes with red hair. Her eyes, though they were under the shadow of her hat, and he could not be certain, he diagnosed as green, or maybe blue, or possibly grey. Not that it mattered, for he had a Catholic taste in feminine eyes, so long as they were large and bright, as were the specimens under his immediate notice, he was not the man to quibble about a point of colour. Her nose was small, and on the very tip of it there was a tiny freckle. Her mouth was nice and wide, her chin soft and round. She was just about the height which every girl ought to be. Her figure was trim, her feet tiny, and she wore one of those dresses, of which a man can say no more than that they look pretty well all right. Nature abhors a vacuum. Samuel Marlowe was a susceptible young man, and for many a long month his heart had been lying empty, all swept and garnished, with welcome on the mat. This girl seemed to rush in and fill it. She was not the prettiest girl he had ever seen. She was the third prettiest. He had an orderly mind, one capable of classifying and docketing girls. But there was a subtle something about her, a sort of, how shall one put it, which he had never encountered before. He swallowed convulsively. His well-developed chest swelled beneath its covering of blue flannel and invisible stripe. At last, he told himself, he was in love, really in love, and at first sight, too, which made it all the more impressive. He doubted whether in the whole course of history anything like this had ever happened before to anybody. Oh, to clasp this girl to him, and— But she had bitten him in the arm. That was hardly the right spirit— that, he felt, constituted an obstacle. "'Oh, I'm so sorry!' she cried. Well, of course, if she regretted her rash act, after all, an impulsive girl might bite a man in the arm in the excitement of the moment, and still have a sweet, womanly nature. "'The crowd seems to make Pinky Boodles so nervous.' Sam might have remained mystified, but at this juncture there proceeded from a bundle of rugs in the neighbourhood of the girl's lower ribs a sharp yapping sound, 
of such a calibre as to be plainly audible over the confused noise of Mamies who were telling Sadies to be sure and right, of Bills who were instructing Dicks to look up old Joe in Paris and give him their best, and of all the fruit boys, candy boys, magazine boys, American flag boys, and telegraph boys who were hawking their wares on every side. "'I hope he didn't hurt you much. You're the third person he's bitten to-day.' She kissed the animal in a loving and congratulatory way on the tip of his black nose. "'Not counting waiters at the hotel, of course,' she added. And then she was swept from him in the crowd, and he was left thinking of all the things he might have said, all those graceful, witty, ingratiating things, which just make a bit of difference on these occasions. He had said nothing. Not a sound, exclusive of the first sharp yowl of pain, had proceeded from him. He had just goggled. A rotten exhibition. Perhaps he would never see this girl again. She looked the sort of girl who comes to see her friends off and doesn't sail herself. And what memory of him would she retain? She would mix him up with the time when she went to visit the deaf and dumb hospital. 2. Sam reached the gangplank, showed his ticket, and made his way through the crowd of passengers, passengers' friends, stewards, junior officers, and sailors who infested the deck. He proceeded down the main companionway, through a rich smell of India rubber and mixed pickles, as far as the dining saloon, then turned down the narrow passage leading to his stateroom. Staterooms on ocean liners are curious things. When you see them on the chart in the passenger office, with the gentlemanly clerk drawing rings round them in pencil, they seem so vast that you get the impression that, after stowing away all your trunks, you will have room left over to do a bit of entertaining, possibly an informal dance or something. When you go on board you find that the place has shrunk to the dimensions of an undersized cupboard in which it would be impossible to swing a cat. And then, about the second day out, it suddenly expands again. For one reason or another the necessity for swinging cats does not arise, and you find yourself quite comfortable. Sam, balancing himself on the narrow, projecting ledge which the chart in the passenger office had grandiloquently described as a lounge, began to feel the depression which marks the second phase. He almost wished now that he had not been so energetic in having his room changed in order to enjoy the company of his cousin Eustace. It was going to be a tight fit. Eustace's bag was already in the cabin, and it seemed to take up the entire fairway. Still, after all, Eustace was a good sort, and would be a cheerful companion. And Sam realized that if the girl with the red hair was not a passenger on the boat, he was going to have need of diverting society. A footstep sounded in the passage outside. The door opened. "'Hello, Eustace,' said Sam. Eustace Hignett nodded listlessly, sat down on his bag, and emitted a deep sigh. He was a small, fragile-looking young man, with a pale, intellectual face. Dark hair fell in a sweep over his forehead. He looked like a man who would write vers libre, as indeed he did. "'Hello,' he said in a hollow voice. Sam regarded him blankly. He had not seen him for some years, but, going by his recollections of him at the university, he had expected something rather cheerier than this. In fact, he had rather been relying on Eustace to be the life and soul of the party. The man sitting on the bag before him could hardly have filled that role at a gathering of Russian novelists. "'What on earth's the matter?' said Sam. "'The matter?' Eustace Hignett laughed mirthlessly. "'Oh, nothing, nothing much, nothing to signify, only my heart's broken.' He eyed with considerable malignity the bottle of water in the rack above his head, a harmless object provided by the White Star Company for clients who might desire to clean their teeth during the voyage. "'If you would care to hear the story,' he said. "'Go ahead.' "'It is quite short. That's good. "'Soon after I arrived in America I met a girl. 
"'Talking of girls,' said Sam with enthusiasm, "'I've just seen the only one in the world that really amounts to anything. "'It was like this. "'I was shoving my way through the mob on the dock when suddenly—' "'Shall I tell you my story, or will you tell yours?' "'Oh, sorry. Go ahead.' Eustace Hignett scowled at the printed notice on the wall, informing occupants of the stateroom that the name of their steward was J. B. Midgley. "'She was an extraordinarily pretty girl. "'So was mine. "'I give you my honest word, "'I never in all my life saw such... "'Of course, if you prefer that I postponed my narrative,' "'said Eustace coldly. "'Oh, sorry. Carry on. "'She was an extraordinarily pretty girl. "'What was her name? "'Wilhelmina Bennett.' She was an extraordinarily pretty girl, and highly intelligent. I read her all my poems, and she appreciated them immensely. She enjoyed my singing. My conversation appeared to interest her. She admired my— I see, you made a hit. Now, get on with the story. Don't bustle me, said Eustace querulously. Well, you know, the voyage only takes eight days. I've forgotten where I was. "'You were saying what a devil of a chap she thought you. "'What happened? "'I suppose, when you actually came to propose, "'you found she was engaged to some other Johnny?' "'Not at all. "'I asked her to be my wife, and she consented. "'We both agreed that a quiet wedding was what we wanted. "'She thought her father might stop the thing if he knew, "'and I was dashed sure my mother would, "'so we decided to get married without telling anybody. "'By now,' said Eustace, "'with a morose glance at the porthole, I ought to have been on my honeymoon. Everything was settled. I had the license and the parson's fee. I had been breaking in a new tie for the wedding. And then you quarrelled? Nothing of the kind. I wish you would stop trying to tell me the story. I'm telling you. What happened was this. Somehow, I can't make out how, Mother found out. And then, of course, it was all over. She stopped the thing. Sam was indignant. He thoroughly disliked his Aunt Adeline, and his cousin's meek subservience to her revolted him. "'Stopped it? I suppose she said, "'Now, Eustace, you mustn't,' and you said, "'Very well, mother,' and scratched the fixture? "'She didn't say a word. She never has said a word. As far as that goes, she might never have heard anything about the marriage.' "'Then how do you mean she stopped it?' "'She pinched my trousers.' "'Pinched your trousers?' "'Eustace groaned. "'All of them. The whole bally lot. "'She gets up long before I do, "'and she must have come into my room "'and cleaned it out while I was asleep. "'When I woke up and started to dress, "'I couldn't find a single damned pair of bags "'in the whole place. "'I looked everywhere. "'Finally I went into the sitting-room "'where she was writing letters "'and asked if she had happened to see any anywhere.' She said she had sent them all to be pressed. She said she knew I never went out in the mornings. I don't, as a rule. And they would be back at lunchtime. A fat lot of use that was. I had to be at the church at eleven. Well, I told her I had a most important engagement with a man at eleven, and she wanted to know what it was, and I tried to think of something, but it sounded pretty feeble, and she said I had better telephone to the man and put it off. I did it, too. "'rang up the first number in the book "'and told some fellow I had never seen in my life "'that I couldn't meet him because I hadn't any trousers. "'He was pretty peeved, "'judging from what he said about my being on the wrong number. "'And Mother, listening all the time, "'and I knowing that she knew, "'something told me that she knew, "'and she knowing that I knew she knew, "'I tell you, it was awful. "'And the girl? "'She broke off the engagement.' Apparently she waited at the church from eleven till one-thirty, and then began to get impatient. She wouldn't see me when I called in the afternoon, but I got a letter from her saying that what had happened was all for the best, as she had been thinking it over, and had come to the conclusion that she had made a mistake. She said something about my not being as dynamic as she had thought I was. She said that what she wanted was something more like Lancelot or Sir Galahad, and would I look on the episode as closed." "'Did you explain about the trousers?' "'Yes. It seemed to make things worse. "'She said that she could forgive a man anything except being ridiculous.' 
"'I think you're well out of it,' said Sam, judicially. "'She can't have been much of a girl.' "'I feel that now, but it doesn't alter the fact that my life is ruined. I have become a woman-hater. It's an infernal nuisance, because practically all the poetry I have ever written rather went out of its way to boost women, and now I'll have to start all over again and approach the subject from another angle. "'Women!' "'When I think how Mother behaved, and how Wilhelmina treated me, I wonder there isn't a law against them. "'What mighty ills have not been done by woman! Who was to betray the capital?' "'In Washington?' said Sam, puzzled. He had heard nothing of this, but then he generally confined his reading of the papers to the sporting page. "'In Rome, you ass, ancient Rome!' "'Oh, as long ago as that?' I was quoting from Thomas Otway's Orphan. I wish I could write like Otway. He knew what he was talking about. Who was to betrayed the capital? A woman. Who lost Mark Anthony the world? A woman. Who was the cause of a long ten years' war, and laid at last old Troy in ashes? Woman. Destructive, damnable, deceitful woman. Well, of course, he may be right in a way, as regards some women, I mean, but the girl I met on the dock. Don't, said Eustace Hignett. If you have anything bitter and derogatory to say about women, say it, and I will listen eagerly. But if you merely wish to gibber about the ornamental exterior of some dashed girl you have been fool enough to get attracted by, go and tell it to the captain, or the ship's cat, or J. B. Midgley. Do try to realize that I am a soul in torment. I am a ruin, a spent force, a man without a future. What does life hold for me? Love? I shall never love again. My work? I haven't any. I think I shall take to drink. Talking of that, said Sam, I suppose they open the bar directly we pass the three-mile limit. How about a small one? Eustace shook his head gloomily. "'Do you suppose I pass my time on board ship in gadding about and feasting? "'Directly the vessel begins to move, I go to bed and stay there. "'As a matter of fact, I think it would be wisest to go to bed now. "'Don't let me keep you if you want to go on deck.' "'It looks to me,' said Sam, "'as if I had been mistaken in thinking that you were going to be a ray of sunshine on the voyage.' "'Ray of sunshine,' said Eustace Hignett, pulling a pair of mauve pyjamas out of the kit-bag. "'I'm going to be a volcano.' Sam left the stateroom and headed for the companion. He wanted to get on deck and ascertain if that girl was still on board. About now the sheep would be separating from the goats, the passengers would be on deck, and their friends returning to the shore." A slight tremor in the boards on which he trod told him that this separation must have already taken place. The ship was moving. He ran lightly up the companion. Was she on board, or was she not? The next few minutes would decide. He reached the top of the stairs and passed out on to the crowded deck, and as he did so a scream, followed by a confused shouting, came from the rail nearest the shore. He perceived that the rail was black with people hanging over it. They were all looking into the water. Samuel Marlowe was not one of those who pass aloofly by when there is excitement toward. If a horse fell down in the street, he was always among those present. And he was never too busy to stop and stare at a blank window on which were inscribed the words, Watch this space. In short, he was one of nature's rubbernecks, and to dash to the rail and shove a fat man in a tweed cap to one side was with him the work of a moment. He had thus an excellent view of what was going on, a view which he improved the next instant by climbing up and kneeling on the rail. There was a man in the water, a man whose upper section, the only one visible, was clad in a blue jersey. He wore a bowler hat, and from time to time, as he battled with the waves, he would put up a hand and adjust this more firmly on his head. A dressy swimmer. Scarcely had he taken in this spectacle when Marlowe became aware of the girl he had met on the dock. She was standing a few feet away, leaning out over the rail with wide eyes and parted lips. Like everybody else, she was staring into the water. As Sam looked at her, 
the thought crossed his mind that here was a wonderful chance of making the most tremendous impression on this girl. What would she not think of a man who, reckless of his own safety, dived in and went boldly to the rescue? And there were men, no doubt, who would be chumps enough to do it, he thought, as he prepared to shift back to a position of greater safety. At this moment the fat man in the tweed cap, incensed at having been jostled out of the front row, made his charge. He had but been crouching, the better to spring. Now he sprang. His full weight took Sam squarely in the spine. There was an instant in which that young man hung, as it were, between sea and sky. Then he shot down over the rail to join the man in the blue jersey, who had just discovered that his hat was not on straight, and had paused to adjust it once more, with a few skilful touches of the finger. End of chapter 2, part 1, read by Kara Schallenberg, on June 4, 2011, in San Diego, California.